Good morning, everybody. My name is Philip Shetler Jones from the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much for joining us. We're here to talk about the Russia China relationship and get a sense about what's changed, what's new, and, and, and what's going to happen next. I'm joined, I'm very grateful to welcome Professor Jiang Zhe from um, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, where he's research senior research fellow and also a distinguished professor at Shanghai University. Um, Alexander Gabuev from Carnegie Moscow, um, to give him a full title, Chair in the Russia in Asia program from the Carnegie Moscow Center. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions to the panelists and then after about 15 minutes I'd like to turn uh, the floor over to questions. So please get your questions ready. Um, but if I could start uh, with Alexander and just ask us if you, could, if you could first give us an idea about what's happened uh, recently and what's, what's really deeper driving the changes in the relationship because we had a, a very symbolic reminder of the, the importance of the relationship just last week where there was a very large scale military exercise you probably uh, noticed involving something like 300,000 troops, um, 36,000 tanks, uh, air, maritime, land operations between China, the Russian Federation, and Mongolia. And it was actually, if I'm correct, the first time since, um, since these exercises were going where a country which is not a an ally or a, a, a country from the former Soviet Union has joined the exercise. So this, this sounds like a pretty significant development. Can you start by telling us what's driving this change? I would add to that that China used to be one of the target countries of this exercise because the contingency planning of this strategic command, Command East, was always partly about the US and its allies and mm. mainly about China and at symbolically at least stopped and the Russians say to China, hey China, we are not afraid of you anymore. We don't look at you as a primarily security threat in the Far East. Mm. And we even invite you to develop interoperability. Mm. So you might think whether Russians are naive not to think that long term this relationship can be more rocky. Mm. And they have some contingency planning against potential threat from China and vice versa. But I think it's going into that direction. Uh, just stepping back and answer to your question, I'll try to be very quick. Uh, if geopolitics is something like a dating app, like a Tinder, I think that Russia and China have natural reasons to swipe each other the same direction all the time for three particular reasons. One, they share a very long continental border which takes a hell lot of resources to defend. And since both countries see each other's national security priorities elsewhere, they don't want to go back to the 1960s, 1970s, the years of confrontation, where they invested a lot of money and people and personnel and weaponry to defend this border. So once the relationship warmed up and the opportunity presented to sort out the territorial issue, they demilitarized the border and went elsewhere. Russia is obsessed with NATO. Russia is involved in the Middle East. Russia is very nervous about the developments in Central Asia. China is obsessed with South China Sea, Taiwan. Uh, Japan, the Klam Plateau. So the priorities lie elsewhere. Mm. Why would you invest millions? So the bottom line is that we don't want to be with each other all the time, but the confrontation is just too costly and two countries want to uh, avoid that at any cost. Point number one. Point number two, mutual compatibility of the economies. Russia, by and large, is a huge oil and gas tanks with some metals and sophisticated manufacturing in nuclear power plants, sophisticated weapons industry, but that's it. China is a natural market for Russia, and Russia is ideally placed between two large consumers of its export items. If you look at the structure of Russia's trade with Europe and with China, it's absolutely similar structure. Russia actually sells more machine to China than it sells to Europe. Uh, but the volumes are different because Russia has traditionally been oriented towards the West where the pipeline and the infrastructure exists and which is very close proximity. Point number three, these are political setups in both countries. Uh, China is a socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics. Russia is a democracy by constitution, but in fact both political systems are different from democracies in the West. And they have a lot of overlapping interests like NGO law in this country 
was written with huge intake from the Russian experience. Mm. Russia is very interested in Golden Shield project, like the, the cyber wall that defends Chinese internet from hostile influences overseas. So here you have a lot of overlaps, and these are the fundamentals. What's changed was Russia's confrontation with the West after annexation of Crimea mm -hmm. and the sanctions that were imposed on Russia. So if Russia looked for new markets, sources of capital and sources of technologies, it cannot go to its traditional partners because they are part of the sanction regime. Mm -hmm. Many developed nations in the East, in this part of the world, like Japan and South Korea, are US treaty allies. Where do you go? So China is the only place to go, and Russia did a pretty sophisticated by Russian standards, of course, interagency net assessment of the risks associated with China, and discovered that actually many of those risks that China thought, oh, China's gonna invade into Siberia because of the demographics. They discovered that Chinese population is going down, the workforce is going down, the wages are going up. Mm. So the economic incentive to go to Russia are decreasing, and after the ruble devaluation, they are decreasing to zero. So we have huge influx of Chinese to Russia now, but these are tourists, and all the permanent workers from China are actually going back because there are much more labor opportunities here in China. Uh, weapon reverse engineering, that used to happen a decade ago. Right now, China is so sophisticated and so advanced that in 10, 15 years time, they don't want to copy Russian technology. So it's either that Russia sells it now or it sells it never because China will be there on their own. And the list goes on, but the Russians discover that yes, there are some risks. But right now, we have no other choice as to open up to China. And for China, that's also a strategic opportunity to have this secure periphery on the north, mm. have access to resources, and have Russia voice in the international organizations. And last point, there is Trump going simultaneously after the two. So that drives the two much closer together, probably sometimes closer than they both want in natural circumstances. Thank you very much, Alex. You, you started to give us some of the motives as well from the Chinese perspective. So on, on that one, I'd, I'd like to turn to Professor, Professor Jiang and ask, if we consider the ups and downs historically in the relationship, uh, some periods very close uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the 1950s, and then a, a kind of a, a less close period, and then uh, after the Cold War, relations changed completely because of the, the events and the end of the Soviet Union. So from your point of view, what, what is the driving uh, factors behind this recent warming up of the relationship? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you know, uh, I would say any country's foreign policy is closely related to its traditional culture. And China's foreign policy is also closely related to its traditional culture. And according to Chinese culture, we say a neighbor is more important than a distant relative. So if you are my neighbor, then you are more important than my uncle in Shanghai or in, 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 in uh, uh, any other places, okay? So China would say it's very important for me to have a good neighbor, okay? So this is a, a kind of a cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. And as my colleague mentioned just now, that uh, yes, these two, two, uh, two countries, or the former Soviet Union, had uh, some difficult times. As I still remember when I was a boy, I heard there was a war between us on the island called Zhenbao Island. At that time, mm. I, was quite, like, I was quite a kid, but I still remember. Mm. There are some pictures, cartoons, Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army fought against uh, the Soviet troops. But we <coughs> realized that this kind of history was bad for, for Russia and for us. So we need to have cooperation. Mm. And uh, well, as you know, China wants to make friends with everybody, including the US. But the US is happy to make enemies. In the past, Japan, and then Europe, and now China. So the US feels very relaxed, feel very proud to have an enemy. Uh, so, and uh, then Russia and China say, well, we can make friends. And, and also that's good. And of course, as you know, that the uh, Chinese economy needs uh, all kinds of resources. And Russia is so close to China, so we don't need to spend lots of money on transporting resources from far away. 
So it's very convenient for China and the, and the Russia to have cooperation. Okay, so I would say it's quite logical. And regarding your question about the current military exercise, as you know, the two sides have built the so-called comprehensive strategic partnership. What does that mean? Strategic partnership, comprehensive. That means we, we are going to have cooperation in every field, not only energy, resources, and we also have these kind of ties in the field of people-to-people -people exchanges, politics, and the military. So why not? Mm. And now, so I, I guess some of you were here just now, 10 minutes ago. You heard uh, the two hawkish US congressmen. So since we have a common enemy, well, why not should we join hands together? Thank you very much, Professor Jang. The, the, this, this kind of uh, description is, is, is very helpful and very, uh, very much disputed and debated, I think, at the moment. Uh, enemy, ally, um, some, some people argue that there is an alliance, or uh, an, maybe not by name or treaty, but a de facto alliance being created. Other people are thinking about the need for uh, that relationship to be to be broken up or split um, to prevent a potential alliance. So what what do you what do you hear? And sometimes you think people really don't understand. What what are people getting wrong about the the relationship and and what it's going towards and what it can become? Alex, can I start? I with think you? that we're still using this 20th century lens. And when we talk alliance, we look at Warsaw Pact or at NATO mm -hmm. as a model. Mm. which is wrong probably for 21st century relationship between great powers. All the fundamentals I mentioned in the Tinder of geopolitics, uh, I think are there and will be there for foreseeable future. Uh, what I think is that both countries' military see uh, themselves as cap fully capable to uh, protect the motherland and to do missions outside of relative borders, like mm. what China is doing in South China Sea, what Russia is doing now in Syria. Russia doesn't need massive Chinese help in Syria. China doesn't need Russia to be engaged in the South China Sea. We can take care of our own things. What we definitely don't want to do is to give each other type of Article 5 security guarantees. If Russian plane was recently shut down in Syria and Russian military blames Israel, if Russia is hypothetical, very unlikely scenario, Russia is way smarter than that, to launch a counteroffensive and shut down some Israeli fighter jets. And then there is a military confrontation which involves the US. China will have to declare war to the US in order to do what exactly? To protect Russia's interests because it was so stupid to be involved in Syrian conflict in the first place. If Chinese naval vessels collide with Vietnamese naval vessels over the oil rig in the South China Sea, Russia would have to declare war to Vietnam, which it doesn't want to because Vietnam is an important strategic partner. So both countries don't want to give each other this type of security guarantees. They don't need to do that at all. But what they see is that there's a level of interoperability when they operate in places like Central Asia or probably Korean Peninsula. That's the two theaters where I see some potential for interoperability. And then cyber operations and doing something like foreign policy ran a very good piece on how the Chinese intelligence got into the communication of CIA agents here. And there is a line that the Chinese intelligence shared this information with the Russians. And that probably led to some capture of CIA intelligence assets inside Russia. So we're going to see that level of cooperation on cyber and probably simultaneously and coordinated operations in new domains, but not traditional type of uh, Article 5 alliance. Last point, NATO alliance or US alliance in China, in Asia Pacific, involve a hierarchy. Though everybody is nominally equal in NATO, if you talk like Slovenia and the US, everybody knows who is the master in the alliance, who is in the driving seat. So that question would arise if Russia and China are to form military alliance. We don't want to be in this hierarchical relationship. We don't want to talk who is Google, who is Didi, who is the elder brother, who is the younger brother. So this helps to maintain 
at least nominal or symbolic equality in the relationship. Thank you very much, Alex. President well, uh, based on my humble knowledge of English language, my understanding of the word alliance can be understood more or less like military alliances. Okay, in Chinese we call it the German, and in English you say alliance. Well, let me tell you that uh, China wants to make a partnership, not alliance. So I don't know if uh, some of you can understand Chinese. We say German, not Japan, uh, 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 not German. Well, it's a beautiful Chinese language, phonetic transcription. Uh, sounds very nice. German uh, and Japan. Okay. So China wants to seek partnership, not military alliances. Why? Well, we believe that uh, nowadays, particularly how many years? More than 20 years after the ending of the Cold War, military alliances is not good for maintaining world peace. Some military alliances, well, like NATO, has bombed Libya, Kosovo, and many other places. So China does not want to make a military alliance with Russia to bomb anywhere. We just want to maintain peace. We want to create a partnership. As I said, comprehensive, comprehensive strategic partnership. That's good for maintaining world peace. Thank you, and th thank you both very much. Uh, now I'd like to open up a little bit to the audience for questions. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. Uh, a microphone will come to you. And if you could just mention uh, your name, your affiliation, and then try and keep the questions short so that we can get through as many as possible. I think the first one is here on the right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jonathan Tepperman, Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy. Um, I'm curious how uh, uh, long-lasting you think this new warm relationship can be. The conventional wisdom in Washington has long been that, yes, China and Russia may find uh, reason to cooperate in the short term, but that the um, structural um, uh, differences between the two countries, as well as their core interests, are so different with China being a growing country, Russia being a dying country, et cetera, et cetera, um, that uh, any relationship um, can't last very long. Um, and a related second part to the question, um, is there an opportunity still for uh, an American leader, maybe not this one, to do a Nixon and pull China back towards the United States and away from Russia, as Nixon did in the, in the 70s? Thank you. Um, Professor Jang, would you like to take a shot at that? Well, I'm not a, a kind of fortune tailor, but I, I believe, based on my humble knowledge of international relations, I would say China's relationship with Russia can last long, long. Of course, there, there is some kind of, a, uh, uh, how would you say, different understandings. Well, I, but I would say this marriage will last long and long. And uh, regarding your second question, well, I, I don't want to use your words, pull back China into its orbit. But uh, I would like to point out that somebody, some of your colleagues say they should be G2, right? Chimerica, G2. But as, as Chinese uh, 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 say, G2 is not possible. US and China cannot govern the world. I have a, a stupid idea. Probably the US, China, Russia, and the EU can join hands to deal with so many global issues. Of course, that's not easy. I don't know if the US is willing to join hands with China, Russia, and the EU to deal with global governance, to push forward the global governance, and to deal with these global issues. So, Please ask your president, can you agree to join hands with China, Russia, and the EU to deal with global issues? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Alex, what, what do you say about the idea that uh, America sh could uh, break Russia away in that sense? I think that on, on, on the first one, uh, I don't see that many structural differences, frankly. I think that they are overhyped and people are still living in the past knowledge of, oh, Russians are so afraid of Chinese hordes, which are going to take on Siberia in the Far East, uh, which is not happening at all. Like all the factual based study that we do at Carnegie Endowment show exactly reverse. Russians have trouble to attract Chinese investment and Chinese labor into the Far East. And they are just scratching their heads and trying to make the case for Chinese investment where they say, oh no, Africa is actually much more attractive than you, Russia. So that's the new reality, frankly. Uh, on issues like Central Asia, there is a current division of labor where China is the total, uh, dominant economic presence and Russia provides security there. I think that's unstable and, Russia will, and China will play more visible security role. But Russia learns, it's, there is an internal debate which is right now starting in Russia. And Russia thinks that, okay, if there is about burden sharing, we probably cannot police the region for 20, 30 years to come. And if China will step in and do something meaningful while respecting our formal alliances with Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, why not? So I think that's manageable. The flashpoints could arrive if you have a big domestic upheaval either here or in Russia. If you have a democratic transition in Russia with ultra-liberal pro-Western government, which says, oh, China is a shameful authoritarian dictatorship, we shouldn't be partners with that, right? Or here, there is an upheaval with a more open and democratic setup if you read the writings of Chinese nationalists, like the very famous book, Zhongguo Bu Gao Xing, Unhappy China. There is a lot about Russia. I don't see that two opportunities on the horizon for the foreseeable future at all. So as it's for now, I think it's pretty stable. When we talk about pulling China back in or Russia back in, I don't think that's possible with the current setup. And uh, frankly, I think that the US should probably spend more time in thinking of how to manage the competition between great powers in 21st century in the age of relative US decline that its primacy going to be challenged and how do we not shoot at each other and compete in a more peaceful way than to think that I can pull somebody back in and then Pax Americana will continue for indefinite times. Thank you very much. Do we have another question? I think there was a question. Uh, thank you, sir. So Ken Polverman, uh, I work for a startup that has interest in both of your countries, uh, and I'd like to see peace prevail. Um, in terms of uh, the US, no question we have a blowhard president who's very unpopular. Uh, my question is, if we use the Tinder analogy again, didn't you swipe right a little too fast here? And that the underlying fu fundamentals of the relationship were a lot stronger than you know the rhetoric coming out of just one man. Alex, when you start with that one. Uh, as everything about Russia and China with the media culture, and that's, please, friends from the media, don't take it as an offense, I would be very cautious and careful about believing 100% of what the official narrative in the media says. Like Russia and China have natural interests in portraying and promoting this relationship way beyond than the actual reality is. So if we look at the economic front, as I mentioned, Russia have real troubles in attracting a lot of private Chinese investors to Russia. And there are a lot of structural issues where Russia has to work on uh, being just more attractive to for Chinese uh, investors, for example. And it will take a lot of time. Though Russia is doing that because it has no other way of sanctions which will last forever with CATSA passed last year and with the domestic situation in the US and particularly that Russia continues to do the Skripals and some election interference in the US. But uh, it's gonna take a lot of time but it's gonna be fixed. So again, don't necessarily believe the official narrative 100%, but there is truth to the basic assumption of growing partnership. Another question here, please. Hi, this is a slightly off topic, but um, this is for Professor Zhang. Uh, do you think that a similar partnership could be formed between your other neighbor from the south, uh, India, um, and or are they fundamentally too different and cannot be compared between the two countries? 
Thank well, you. regarding the China's relationship uh, with India, I would say on the whole it's improving. Look at uh, the, uh, the dangerous incident uh, before the BRICS summit in Xiamen, okay, uh, that was last year. And in the end of the day, the two sides uh, found a peaceful solution. So that's good. That's a very good uh, encouraging sign. And of course, the uh, bilateral relationship is always a two-way street. Like, like the husband and the wife, well, if you want to maintain good marriage, both the husband and the wife need to do something. So I believe that uh, India uh, and China will improve our relationship, uh, well, sooner or later. And because we are neighbors, okay, of course we need to do something. Uh, like people to people exchanges, it, t it takes me almost one day for me to go to Goa for a BRICS, uh, BRICS think tank summit. Well, we are neighbors. Why it's difficult to, for me to get a visa to travel from this place to the, in such a short distance, okay? So uh, well, I think uh, we, can sh we, sh we can do something. Uh, we, can, we can put aside this kind of board dispute and we do something in the economic field and people to people uh, exchanges. And uh, I know that uh, some of your colleagues complain all the time, oh, look at our trade imbalance, which is not sustainable for India. But you know, Chinese, the Chinese market is more competitive, okay? So if, we, if you want to sell to China, you need to be more competitive. So I hope that uh, your products will be more competitive uh, uh, on the Chinese market. Okay, and uh, let me say, I say the following point, I, I will say, which is very important. Now, when you are hungry, you can eat anything, bread, noodle, rice, dumplings, pizza. Now, but when you are not hungry, you will choose what you want to eat. And in the past, 30 years, 40 years ago, China was hungry for foreign capital. So any capital, no matter this, foreign enterprises was polluting or not. We, we wanted it. But now China said, well, we are going to choose some of the best foreign capital. So that means the Chinese market is becoming more and more selective and more competitive. So you cannot say this kind of change is discrimination against the foreign enterprises. Okay? Look at my hometown. My hometown is in the uh, south of Jiangsu province, near Shanghai. It's called the land of fish and the rice. And in the sky, there is heaven, and on the land, there is my hometown, okay? Suzhou and Hangzhou. But uh, when, when I was, was uh, quite young at that time, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, my hometown introduced uh, foreign enterprises which which polluted lots of rivers and, and all the fish died. But can you go to my hometown to set up this kind of pollution factory? No, definitely not. So you cannot say, oh, you are discri discriminating me. No, this is not uh, the case. Uh, we are going to, <coughs> we're going to choose some of the best uh, foreign enterprises. That's not discrimination. So I hope uh, India can try to think about how you can become more sexy, more attractive to, to us, so we can buy more products from you. Uh, do you want to add anything on that one, or should we have one last? I think we've got time for one last fast question. Has anybody got a quick question? Okay. Well, I just want to ask you for a very quick summing up um, on both sides. Uh, a short description of how good the relationship could be in, in 10 years from now. What could it look like if, if it goes as well as it possibly could from the, the interest that you described as driving it? We could start with Alex. For me, that's an uh, asymmetrical partnership where uh, it's mutually beneficial but increasingly asymmetrical, where China is going up. Russia is staying flat, and Russia needs China much more than the other way around, because Russia is an international sanctions regime, and China is not still. Uh, the 
I think, sophistication of Chinese diplomacy and Chinese state is that it's not showing Russia this symmetry. It's treating it as an equal. If you compare that to the way the West is treating Russia, at least that's the Russian public perception and narrative, you know, talking about human rights record or corruption or elections in Russia, uh, definitely Russia is much more comfortable in talking to China. So I think at this high level political dialogue with stick, we probably will see some more robust military cooperation, particularly in joint development of some weapon systems, uh, cyber domain, and maybe even space. Uh, and then we will have growing number of Chinese companies doing business in Russia and growing market share for Chinese goods. Right now, uh, China has grown its uh, participation in the Russian economy for roughly 12% around Crimean annexation to roughly 18% now. So it's growing fast and we'll see probably 25% uh, of trade in uh, the coming 10 years. That's my hunch. Thank you. Well, several years ago, Chinese President Xi Jinping talked to President Obama in California. Let's build the so-called uh, new type of a new type of partnership between major powers. Mm. This is quite famous. Everybody knows that. But uh, the U.S. says, "No, no, no, no. What's that?" As a, so the U.S. does not want to accept this kind of invitation. Okay, now what's the nature of this kind of new partnership? Means no, conf no confrontation, only cooperation. So between Russia and China, no confrontation, only cooperation. So I would say this kind of partnership will last longer and longer. Thank you very much and thank you the audience for your excellent questions. Join me in thanking Professor Zui and Alex for a lovely panel. Thanks very much. <laughs>